there are several different reasons that land tenure matters a lot to Red, and uh, I guess I could group them around three or four different ideas. First of all, there are many policies one could incorporate under Red, a Red strategy, but the options are quite limited if you don't take into account land tenure, and land tenure is important partly for the principle of Red itself is to compensate people, to reward people who are sequestering carbon or, or avoiding deforestation, um, compensating them for lost opportunities. And if you, so you need to know who you're compensating. So it has to be clear sort of what the boundaries are of the area. And also if you're then uh, supposed to suspend payments because people aren't doing what they've promised to do, then you also need to know who, who to hold accountable. So this is important. But there's also a whole uh, issue in terms of equity and the rights of people living in forests currently. So it's important to understand when you talk about tenure that there's a there's several angles to it, right? Clarifying tenure for red could mean just giving all the forest to a private landholder and solving the problem. But it, first of all, it won't solve the problem. Second of all, it's <clears throat> it's a serious equity issue in terms of the people currently living in forests, their livelihoods, and their customary rights over time. And uh, it's but it's not just an equity issue. And I think that's the other important thing to remember that if there's a big movement out called No Rights, No Red, they you know, a lot of them believe in what they're arguing, that in fact, if rights aren't respected in forests, there will be uh, protests, there will be sabotage, there will be risks to investors and so on in terms of getting funding for red and getting it up and, and running off the ground. So I think it's, uh, there are many different angles to it. And another, both a practical issue and a moral issue. And also a lot of people argue that, uh, or some people anyway, argue that land tenure alone is a strategy that if you solved or addressed land tenure insecurity, conflicts in forests, that that alone might already um, do as much as a red could ever do just by clarifying rights and encouraging people to invest in longer term interests in the forest. Necessarily? <coughs> I mean, just the fact of clarifying tenure, how, how would that sort of solve the problem? There are a lot of studies over time showing a, the correlations with secure rights, but of course, it's not always true. I mean, there, there are times when secure, when insecure rights give people more opportunities to, or people avoid opportunities to invest in, in clearing and planting something more valuable because they don't have the secure rights. And there are other opportunities where someone who is given a title now has, you know, now is willing to make an investment in oil palm or clearing the forest. So it doesn't, it's obviously not always true. And it, I think that's why it's important. But there are correlations in terms of land tenure security. <clears throat> the problem is that it, that alone is, is not going to be sufficient in any case. That really does have to be combined with other kinds of policies. Mm -hmm. You were talking there about some of the risks associated with clarifying tenure. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? I think um, from a rights perspective, which is the main thing that I work on, the, I think the biggest risk to clarification is who is going to benefit from clarifying tenure. And there are lots of issues, actually, because when there's both who benefits from clarification? Like I said earlier, it's not just a matter of making sure somebody has title. But if you want to look at who actually has rights to that land, then figuring out how to clarify those rights in a way that actually makes them more secure um, is not always easy because titling is sometimes is often associated with uh, security. But in fact, titles can actually make some people more insecure. Um, there have been studies to show that you know once you have a title, it's easier for someone to buy you out, for example, and or convince you or pressure you to to hand over your land to them. Um, it creates other kinds of incentives. So another issue is that in clarifying tenure, the tendency is often that, for example, what we see in Latin America is that agrarian uh, ministries, which are often man the ones managing, managing titling, want to go in and put a grid across the landscape and just divide it up into equal rectangles. And in fact, local, the way local people manage their forests, the way they've held them over time, <clears throat> often don't fit those grids. And sometimes coming in and putting lines where they weren't before starts creating conflicts with neighbors that didn't previously exist or cut off access to areas that people actually were using previously. It's also complicated in um, contexts where there's a lot of overlapping rights systems. And I think this is particularly apparent in Africa, where some people have rights during some seasons. Uh, neighbors may have rights to the fruits on the tree, whereas someone else has rights to the firewood. And uh, 
perhaps pastoralists come in for a month or two out of the year and graze around the tree or graze the lower branches. I mean, there are all sorts of overlapping rights. So when you then give a title to someone, you have basically denied the rights to all of those other people. And you may be cutting off safety nets, in particular when you think about uh, poor rural people. I think it's definitely a good idea to clarify land tenure, but with coming from a rights perspective and coming from the grassroots and making sure that we understand how people are using forests, um, what rights they have customarily, what rights are legitimate in the local context, and working from the ground up in terms of that clarification. Where it is that complex, is it going to be possible to clarify it in such a way that you can use it for a red kind of scheme? That's a good question. I think that it may be possible. I think the biggest problem is precisely the incredible complexity and the tendency for governments and title, titling agencies to want to simplify. And for red, that would be easier, but it doesn't necessarily work for local people and for their livelihoods. A lot of what is possible is going to depend on the local governance institutions and the trust and the legitimacy of the leaders and who's receiving the funding and how they receive it and the controls over those kinds of transactions. Can we come back to red and what the implications of all this are? I think the biggest problem regarding tenure for red is that it's expensive. It's expensive, it's hard to do logistically, it's, um, it's messy. And on the one hand, I don't think red can work without it. And on the other hand, that's a, a real uh, logistical reality, that it is complex, difficult, expensive. And there aren't a lot of easy solutions. A few years ago, a lot of us were arguing tenure, tenure matters, tenure is important, we have to pay attention to tenure. That seems to be much more accepted now. So to me, the issue now isn't tenure clarification, it's the question of rights and recognizing rights. So again, coming back to what I said at the beginning, that clarification for whom uh, really matters. If you really want to start moving into more and more options about what you can do with RED, you really do have to resolve land tenure. And if you don't want to have poor people getting poorer or getting losing their land rights, uh, losing, the, losing the source of their livelihoods, and you know not just for equity, but again also because they may in fact just start burning down the forest to if they're being left out or being or suffering at the hands of uh, people who are promoting red, whether those are investors or carbon cowboys or whoever, then you know it matters, and I think it is something that has to be solved. Clarifying tenure to me simply means becoming clear who has the right to that particular piece of land and which rights, of course, because because tenure is very complex as well. But to simplify, uh, a large business give them a concession to a large area where there are lots of people living, throw out the people put in a red project, but is that the right thing to do? So the fact that we're talking about all this with red, do you think it's pushed movement towards more attention to tenure and, and, and perhaps more clarification of tenure than we would have otherwise had? I think that may be one of the best benefits of red, is precisely all of the attention being given both to land tenure, what it means, who's it for, and to rights. And I think though there was already a somewhat of a tendency in, in several countries to, be, to begin recognizing the rights of people living in forests, I think it's pay, given a lot more attention to that issue. And certainly there have been some you know, wonderful, bold statements by world leaders about the need to recognize the rights of local people, including the chair of the uh, Indonesian Rights Task Force, which how something like this would move forward, whether he has support from the people he would need support from in order to make it happen is another question. But I think those moments of discourse are, can be very important and an important you know, rallying cry for the rights of indigenous people and local communities. I think a key player in all of this is the state. And of course, the state is not monolithic. The state has many actors within it. There have always been allies of local people and enemies of local people, allies of business, enemies of business within a single state. And I don't think anything's going to change from, from one player. I think it's a matter of forming coalitions and alliances, supporting the people who believe in uh, 
in the principles of RED, which is, of course, to end deforestation and degradation and the rights of local people who live in forests and their rights to livelihood and to live there and, and live su in sustainable, build sustainable communities. Um, so I think that coalitions are key, and I think the watchdog media has been really important in bringing problems to light, um, whether or not you know, everything the media does is always accurate. It is, we know it's not always, but, but the attention is important, and bringing it on the table, putting on the table internationally has been really important.